1981, I think, to house uh, the workers of a nearby mine and then abandoned only two years later. Not entirely abandoned because there was someone that kind of stayed in that village who we're going to talk about later. And then the other point of departure is the unique kind of restorative uh, qualities of a mushroom that we're growing actually in the exhibition space, um, titled The Lion's Mane Mushroom that stimulates a nerve growing factor in the brain and has become um, of an interesting kind of quality in Alzheimer research, I think as of 2011, around that time. And as part of the exhibition and as working on that, um, we've been working on a publication that actually arrived uh, two days ago um, that we published together with Sternberg Press. And it brings together um, lots of the research that kind of underlie the exhibition and kind of looks at the format of the, of the book as an extension to the exhibition space. And um, in it you find interviews and conversations with Anna Gritz in an essay by Robert Gatz, by Gary Sang and by Anna Tsing, who kind of provide a more theoretical perspective on the subject of your research. And um, yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. And um, the event today will consist of a reading by Steve and a film commentary, and then afterwards we're going to have a conversation which you're more than um, happy to join us, if you like. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Marin, for that introduction. Um, I would also just like to say thank you to KW for inviting me initially for doing the show. It's been a really good show to do, um, a lot of fun, and uh, really good to do a show that's been in the planning for one and a half years, but I'm sure we'll get onto it later. So we started on this train of research in 2015, so it's good to finalize it in its current form here. And also say thanks to Sternberg for publishing the book with KW and a practice for everyday life who designed it. And of course, the writers who did three great essays in the book, um, none who are here, but I'd like to say thank you to them anyway. So, there's a text in the book that I wrote as well, and I'm going to read that before talking about the film. I called the owner of the bed and breakfast from the nearest city and mentioned that I was having trouble sourcing a satellite phone. They had one I could borrow, but that didn't transpire when I arrived. The B&B &B pretty much was the town, except for a gas station which doubled up as a Chinese takeout. You paid for your gas at the same counter you ordered your food at. The amount of people who stood around waiting gave the impression that there were either vast suburbs hidden away off the main road, or there were few alternative dining options in the area. From the B&B, &B, it was another four-hour drive to the next town. The night before setting off, the owner's friend sat me down and put a radio in my hands. Here's a walkie-talkie. Just make sure you're on the right channel. From the worried look on my face, he explained further. Oh, just see this dial here? He took the radio and pointed to a notched, round, grey dial on the top edge. It will be signposted by the road. You can't miss it. You'll be fine. Press this button here on the side to talk. You'll probably just hear the chat of the truckers on the road. They talk amongst themselves all the time. What do I do if I get a flat? The b, &B owner chimed in. Just radio one of the truckers. They'll pass the message on back down to us. They all know me here. Just so you're staying here. I continued querying the protocol. Do I need to say over? He gave me a slightly impatient look. No, you don't need to say over. Oh, and watch out for the mushroom pickers, the B&B owner said. They drive like maniacs speeding. They'll run you off the road. They come up, up, they come up here once a year around this time and they make a whole year's worth of money in just a month. I looked at them both blankly. You'll be fine, it's easy, the friend said with a mixture of reassurance and annoyance, placing the radio back in my hands. I nodded while thinking I would immediately forget what I was meant to do. The next morning I rose at 6am and left quietly, passing the gas station slash takeout and heading north on the highway. There were a handful of trucks and SUVs out on the road. I continued about 20 miles until the highway became unpaved. The sonic contrast of the rumbling in the cabin compared to the smooth tarmac was startling but a vehicle overtaking me at high speed and shooting stones into my windscreen in the process put my mind to rest that my truck would be okay handling it. I looked for a gap in the thick wilderness on my left and turned off the highway as per the instructions. This road went from the wide berth of the moderately used highway to a single lane dirt road 
it was in danger of being swallowed by the sheer amount of foliage on either side. A dinged sheet steel sign announced itself prominently, bearing just alone one in black and white, and next to it another sign, new mobile radio channels being implemented on this resource road, RR4. The rusted edges had bled into the white painted surface, giving it an orange-brown border, proving that they had been there for some time. I pressed the button on the radio and spoke in that weak voice when at first waking or practicing a speech when no one is around to hear it. Silver pickup heading up um, mile one. And so the protocol began to seem clear. The road was so narrow you needed the radio to, uh, you needed to radio the logging trucks to alert them of your presence. A truck with a full load of trees on its back wouldn't be able to stop in time if you were coming the other way. Each mile marker by the side of the road bore a sequential number, and you broadcast your position as you passed each sign, heading up mile two, three, four, and so on. The sat now showed my position somewhere off to the side of the road, not on it, but following alongside somewhere in the dense woodland. The device was useless by this stage, and I considered unplugging it and putting it in the glove compartment, but just having it on gave me a sense of comfort. I looked to the trees on my left, and imagine my silver truck plowing through the thicket like a ghost image traveling unhindered. Knowing it was a long drive, I queued up one of the longest albums I had in my iTunes, all six discs, though disc now being a redundant unit, of the basement tapes reissue that came out relatively recently. Well, recently compared to when it was released in 1975, and even more recently considered it was recorded in 1967. The story of this album, after Dylan recorded and released it in an abridged version, the original reel-to-reel -reel tapes were discovered, having been forgotten in a closet for three decades. The tapes were given the modern-day treatment, and the resulting fidelity was good, like wiping greasy spectacles with a fresh cloth. It was home-recorded music, intended to stay in a basement, but somehow wound up in a closet. The newly released tracks were not intact, since some tapes suffered water damage and degradation over the years, drops and gaps in music and words. Some sections were omitted as they were just noise, moments of music lost forever. I continued using the radio at each mile, broadcasting my position, unsure it was even working for two hours until I had any kind of response. The sound was scrambled and abrupt, and I didn't catch what was said. But 15 minutes later, I saw a long truck full of trees pulled over, as I passed, I waved, and they said something to me on the radio, which once again I couldn't decipher. Have a good one, I said. By now, the mile markers were getting harder to spot. Some had been embraced by the surrounding wilderness, swallowed by the forest. Others were just missing. I continued for another two hours until I reached the town, the road gradually winding further and further down to where the buildings were. After, after driving through a forest for four hours, the first buildings emerged out of nowhere, and a sense of relief washed over me. The procession of detached row houses flanking my either side welcoming me. Carrying down the gently curved road, I slowed at a stop sign half covered in moss. I rolled down my window, the silence telling me I was the only person here. It was then that I noticed a fox sat at the side of the road, studying me calmly. I imagined it was wondering where I'd come from. It didn't look like any fox I had seen before, its fur the colour of rust on black, and it was small, and although it was calm, it struck me that there was something slightly odd about it. I wasn't afraid to hold my gaze endlessly, both of us just staring at each other. It was clear there wasn't anything this fox needed from me, and so I drove on. A moment later, I saw a car approaching. We slowed and I waved. I've been expecting you. So I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to talk about the film, and it's um, a director's commentary, although I kept, I kept wanting to call it a DVD commentary, because that's the sort of format that I knew it as. There's um, someone uh, talking over the film that they had made, um, um, although I don't know if you really get them anymore, things like Netflix and things. but. I'm aware that you know DVDs being a redundant unit, a little bit like CDs or discs being a redundant unit in the story. And um, 
that was something in the story that I specifically wanted to focus in on was just the amount of technology that was surrounding me as I was getting further and further into this this um, vast uh, expanse of nature. I had a satellite phone that I couldn't get. I had a walkie-talkie that I couldn't work out how to use and couldn't understand when it did did work. A sat nav stopped working, um, and I was unsure about if my truck could handle it. And all of this, I just put it in, um, and it's sort of less explicitly there in the film, just to express the sense of vulnerability of of being in that remote a place and uh, having this buffer around you. Because while the film is, um, and the show is about sort of self-preservation and kind of like looking inward um, and uh, sort of a solo action of this caretaker and thinking about, you know, your brain, looking inward like that, I just want the film to be, like to open out to be in a, in like a wider sense, just um, to have this subtext of, of like a, an environmental angle that um, that there is a fragility to life, and um, I think that none of this technology can really it can only do so much, and that um, I don't know this this film could could appear a bit like a an, a, a prophetic sort of apocalyptic image in a way, and after some people have seen it, they they had mentioned Chernobyl, which is also interesting. But the thing with Chernobyl is that you do have trees growing up out of, um, growing through houses where nature really is just reclaiming this town. But um, this is different because it's sort of been kept. So yeah, in the first opening scene, there was just a couple of things that I wanted to bring up straight away, which are a couple of themes, and one is this theme of electricity. I wanted to make a parallel between, um, you know, your brain and electric nerves, and, uh, sorry, the electric current in your brain, and this mushroom which can regrow your nerve endings in here. These white boxes which were buzzing, and in fact the whole town was buzzing, I mean, the, the, the sound of the electrical network, I guess, in the town was really, really audible, very noticeable, partly because there was a lot of other missing stimuli that you'd normally have in a town. You could really hear these really strongly. Um, and um, a couple of other things like the mist and even just the sort of color of the light were other things that I wanted to bring into the exhibition, uh, just in a formal sense. You know, things there it is again with the with the electric uh, with the electric current and also being aware that the installation was going to make a lot of sound like the fridges hummed the water tanks and the uh, ultrasonic humidifiers everything had this sort of electric vibration because even though there's no people it, it felt very much like a very live place here as well this is another point which is a um, sort of motif that keeps coming back but again although people don't really live there there still is one resident and this is the sort of sign of that coming back so this is the shopping mall I should probably just give a couple of like facts about the town um, so it was built in 1981 and abandoned in 1983 so it was used for just under two years um, and there was an original settlement there in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, but most of those buildings, apart from one, which isn't shown in the video, were all temporary buildings and all replaced. But at the height in, I guess, 83, it had 1,200 residents or thereabouts. Um, there were 100 houses, uh, seven apartment blocks, a school, a rec center, a kindergarten, a library, gym, sports hall, squash courts, a hospital, a pub, a curling rink, um, and again, I just thought it was, you know, they had to do this to encourage people to move somewhere so remote, um, to give them all of these modern conveniences to surround yourself in the face of, you know, what felt like 
very um, very daunting nature. They even had a branch of the um, Royal Canadian uh, Bank, which is quite something. Probably one of the most I don't know. I'm just guessing one of the most remote branches of a bank, other than maybe the one on Antarctica. Again, with things like the bucket that was just in it with the water dripping, which sort of drips every 30 seconds. Um, there are a couple of things that I put in the film and structured it in the sense that show that there are sort of cracks forming in, I guess quite literal cracks forming in the, um, the appearance of the place. Although it looks very well kept and carpets are, carpets are vacuumed and it's dusted. There wasn't a lot of dust there actually, which is quite strange. That's the branch. <laughs> Most of the film is shown in the order that it was shot in, um, because I did, I was there for 24 hours and just um, was given free reign to just walk around the film. And the way that I structured the film was to go from a um, to go from a sort of communal space to domestic space, and then to go from communal space to domestic space. So it alternates between things like the mall to a house to the rec centre to a house. Um, partly because I wanted it to have this formal quality of being quite wide open to spaces for lots of people, and then closing down to. Um, more private space, sort of being able to look outward and inward. This is the most um, decorated or populated building, or house rather, in the town. They seem to have an absurd amount of armchairs. This still has the plastic on the, uh, mm -hmm. the lamp after all that time. I think that thing though that I was saying earlier about it being open for everyone and then looking inward, so this looking <coughs> inward and outward um, aspect to it is also in the installation itself in terms of the other video that's in the show, this, this anecdote that's on a, on a monitor in the room with the mushrooms. I mean, that's a, a personal anecdote that um, is delivered in quite a, um, I don't know, austere way, I suppose. And immediately outside of that, there are waiting room benches. So you, you're having something that's, um, from a personal viewpoint, to then having something that's suggestive of, of, um, sort of multiple viewpoints. It's quite amazing in some of these parts you can see that the, um, I think we'll go back to it, but you can see that there's still the carpet marks from, from vacuuming. And the paintings in this house, there was only one house of paintings, I imagine that they were sort of collected and, and put here, unless, I don't know, it has been 35 years, so there's a certain amount of, of um, things obviously being moved around in that time. They were um, replicated um, oil paintings that we had hung in the show behind the plastic to be this this element that you'd see and then see again in the film, so they could act like these um, little little memory beacons. This was the apartment that I stayed in for the night, which um, is like a one bedroom one bedroom apartment in the block they called the Bachelor Block. <laughs> I think it was all one bedroom apartment. Again, all this stuff looked barely touched. The 
cooker looked like it had been barely barely used. It's quite amazing to see something with like such a vibrant paint job in a colour so mustardy avocado. And again here, this a bit like the bucket. There was another purposeful um, point of putting in something that just shows like a slight crack in the appearance of this thing. It could come across like it's a set, perhaps. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm so familiar with it. I'm not sure if that's something people would read it as. Again, this that cut is is sort of the first point where I'm sort of breaking the logic of filming the rooms as they are because it's one room to another room and. Because in the apartment, you have so many rooms that are empty, they all look exactly the same, but they all have varying different features. So one might have a breakfast bar on this side, one might have a breakfast bar on that side. And it happens more and more as the film goes on, but the sort of logic of filming one room as it is breaks down in order to sort of dislocate the viewer, even in just in a subtle way, that it will flip to something that wasn't there in the shot before, even though aesthetically it seems the same, just to kind of confuse this logic. This is the Rex Simpson, which um, sort of has a lot of the facilities in. Um, <coughs> it's funny going back to what I was saying about um, sort of personal anecdote in the other video. The whole show, in a weird way, for sort of even how unpopulated and, and blank it is, felt like a very personal show to make because. I'm 35, and this show has been a, um, this town has been abandoned for 35 years. And I was born in Canada, but I have a very strange relationship to the place where I've never really been back. So it's just led to having quite an active interest in the place. And there was something about it where, not to talk, um, I don't know, too fluffy about it, but going there sort of felt as if I could go. It would be the closest opportunity to going back to an aesthetic of from when I was first born. And, you know, I had that in my mind when I went. And uh, just before I left, I bought these new dining chairs, which were these Marcel Brewer Cheska chair kind of copies, these Bauhaus chairs with the chrome and the wicker. And they were the, I bought them, you know, liking them obviously, but knowing that they were the chairs that my parents had when I grew up in Canada. And when I went to the caretaker's house, which was the first port of call when I got there, she had the same chairs. And it was quite a weird feeling having just bought them, going all the way there already with this slight thing in the back of my mind of the town being the same age as me, or also of being stood in time for the same amount of time that I've been existing. And then she also had a little chihuahua. And at the same time, me and my girlfriend were babysitting a little chihuahua that was the same colour, like blonde or beige, I'm not sure what you call the dog colour. Um, and she just had the same model guitar I had. So I was stood in the living room, having just met her, having driven for four hours on this trip, knowing that all of these things in her living room were back in my living room, back at home as well. It led to quite an uncanny uh, feeling. But the whole 24 hours was quite weird because I was quite paranoid and I had a can of bear spray on my belt that I was walking around <laughs> like a total city slicker. Which, um, didn't see any bears here though. Saw bears on the way but not actually in the town. They just had these um, scrawny little foxes that were running around. actually been three caretakers in the 35 years and the current one has been there for 16 years and um, you know the town actually I'll get to that in a sec this is um going back to the idea of nerves and sort of veins and um, 
sort of a framework running through things. If, for that idea, this really felt like the brain or the heart of the whole, the center of the town, which is a generator. I think it's a science fiction. Which is this, I'm guessing, a big generator room because it was a big locked door that just buzzed. Um, but I think it was, I wanted to get to the point where you can see sort of the, the core of the place. That's what I felt like that, that felt like for me. And then bringing it back above ground here, just to reiterate the sense that there is this sort of um, network connecting everything here. And so I was saying that the caretaker uh, has been there for 16 years, but, and although she's the only resident full-time She's kind of far from alone because she uh, has contractors coming in to fix roofs and you, know, you can't do this by yourself, obviously. So there were other people there, but just as the way that I wanted to portray the film to be what I wanted it to be, it uh, obviously the caretaker's never shown, but also the people who are also there are never shown. There were actually a couple of miners who were staying in the apartment block when I was there who each day would fly around in a helicopter laying cables in the river nearby. Um, but you know, I, I'm conscious of, and, and also didn't want to make a documentary about the place. So I'm not telling the history of the place, I'm just showing it in one way, in quite a flat, objective way. So it can, it can be more open to interpretation, it can be you know, it could uh, appear like a memory in the show, or it could be this sort of uh, image, like an end game image of, of some sort of apocalyptic thing, like a mystery. Um, you could just look at it just for the aesthetics of the interior decoration. This is the museum, uh, as she called it. And she referred to the whole town as a living museum, but she also referred to the town as a utopia or paradise. And, um, you know, I really, she was very genuine. And I, 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 I think you couldn't do what she does if you didn't seriously love the place. And if you didn't, if it wasn't a caring, generous uh, gesture that she was doing to care for this place, to be the custodian, Sort of in the hopes, I'm not really sure what, because it's also changed ownership um, a few times in 35 years. So it was originally there to facilitate a mine, and the mine shut and was not profitable, and so they kept it open to hopefully wait for the price of the mineral to go back up so they could reopen the town again, but that never really happened. And then it was sold, and then it was sort of meant to be a retreat. And then I think they realized it cost too much to run. So the plan now is to turn it into a natural gas uh, exportation hub, which would mean bulldozing the town as you know, it, obviously, because um, I think everything would need to be updated to a point that there would be no point. And just looking at the plans that they have, it just doesn't resemble anything like this town. Also to talk about structurally the way this was put together in terms of the um, sound design. This is probably the most apparent example of trying to place sound in a way that um, also guided you, uh, the camera or the viewer around the building. Well, not guided you, but it followed the sense of your movement. So sounds would get louder as you progress down a corridor to get to the source of the thing that was making the sound. one thing about the hospital actually that I really regret which is it had a basement but I didn't go in and 
the town felt incredibly welcoming and not at all daunting other than when the sun started going down and I was in the hospital and I saw the basement and I just couldn't go down there. There's probably about four or five streets that have these sort of townhouses on. And each house, I think, is two, two dwellings, as it were. It seems like each had two front doors. Another thing in the way that I structured the footage was to show things slowly crumbling um, throughout the duration of the video. So you can see the first, you can see the roof here is sort of uh, entirely covered with moss. Um, whereas the first uh, road scene you see, that's where all the new roofs had just been put on. I wanted to structure it this way to sort of show like an entropic direction towards the film that things would be breaking down, that you know, to suggest that even despite efforts to um, preserve something, sort of, you can't nature's always going to win in the end. <coughs> this again, this is actually from the, the first house that had all of the armchairs, but just filmed at a different time of day. And from here, things um, slowly there's more and more edits which make less real life sense. <coughs> Here again, um, just a couple of shots to show um, the telegraph pylons and cables, just to further illustrate the sort of connection and the, the network of humming of the electricity. And I was interested that, that this whole town was still connected, it's still connected up and the heating's still on. And, um, And you can see here these these are looking more worse for wear. All of the paths have just entirely covered over with moss. Some houses were entirely taped off because of black mold infestations. And this is the last sort of road in the town. And the road just comes to a stop and it would have been where the town would have been continued had they uh, had it been more of a profitable enterprise, they would have done phase two and built more streets and more houses. So the road at the end of this just literally ends. And this door was open like that, and towards the end of the film, it's here to to show that things are more porous now, that you can you can just walk in and out freely. I mean, they keep all the doors unlocked anyway, because the amount of people who turn up, they don't want any damage to the buildings. So they just tend to leave everything unlocked to prevent break-ins. This last scene is um, probably an amalgam of four or five houses. Because, you know, one house will have red carpet, but be identically the same as one that has beige and There'll be another beige one that's the mirror copy of that one next to that one. You can walk out the back of that door and walk across the field into the next house. And that one's got the same carpet as the first one, but it's more of a bungalow and less of a two up, two down. It's not in the film, but I did find the, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, aesthetic plans for the construction. And they built this sort of carpet samples and swatches to see. Of course, every now and then there's just a little thing that is out of the ordinary in, in an otherwise quite blank um, landscape. These little touches of remnants that people have put in.
this is where the film ends. Um, at the end of the road where you can see there's a path that's been bulldozed, which nature has started to reclaim. Obviously in the show it's on a loop, so it starts with nature and ends with nature, but there was a way I made it however subtle for it to um, have a trajectory. Thank you.